All right. Let, let, let's get going. Looks like we've got 20, 20 people with us. Uh, my, my name is Dave Treat. I, I lead our blockchain and multi-party systems uh, uh, business at Accenture, and uh, and we've been focused on central bank digital currency for years now. In the second half of this session, uh, our global lead for central bank digital currency, John Villasarios, is going to uh, is going to take over and join us. Uh, and there's John now. You can you can wave. He's gonna he's gonna come back uh, in the uh, in a, in a few minutes. But um, I am thrilled to have here with me uh, uh, just a fantastic uh, partner partner friend colleague uh, in Gen PV from the DTCC. Uh, Jen is is leading some transformational work in this in the space of how distributed ledger technology is going to fundamentally, uh, you know, has the has the potential to fundamentally reshape capital markets and is doing some of the deepest thinking around um, what does it really mean and, and how does it really work. And so um, we're going to start this session uh, with um, uh, with a focus on just the the this specific use case. And I'll, and, um, and and let me pause here. I, I guess I'm going to start with a little bit of a background on CBDC. Um, and then Jen and I will get into a back and forth. But Jen, do you want to say hi or introduce yourself any better than, uh, than I just no, did? Nice job. Um, yeah, you know, happy to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. And I do think that now is just a really interesting um, and exciting time across our industry for a, in a lot of different ways. And the use of technology, including blockchain, is really changing how we work, what our future is going to look like. And so this is just as fun. It's actually just a lot of fun to be a part of it right now. Yes. No. And and you're 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 in a privileged position, uh, you know, as as a, as a leading thought thing thought thought leader in terms of where it plays out. So let let me just set the stage for the for for any for anyone uh, in the audience who is um, who's not up to speed on on the whole uh, central bank digital currency phenomenon. I'm just going to spend three minutes, and then and then we'll get into the into the details of um, of core capital markets. Uh, so across the board. Uh, this we're, we're multiple years in. Actually, uh, John may tell the story of, of when we started to build our our uh, central bank digital currency, our, our blockchain team in 2015. Our very first client was a central bank, and uh, and a lot of work has been happening very quietly for years. Uh, and it's not so quiet anymore. Um, it uh, it's it's gotten very loud as the as the promise of introducing a third form of money, a, a tokenized form, a digitally native form of fiat currency, and the, and the power that that can you know bring to a whole range of use cases that that do range from uh, financial inclusion and retail transactions to uh, you know to core capital markets infrastructure, cross border payments, remittances, etc. And so um, lots of work has been done. The BIS put out a report in the Fall saying that 80% of the world's central banks are uh, are in, embark have embarked on this journey, and that a, a material number of them will be uh, in a production or pre-production stance by 2024. And uh, and so um, we can we can um, we we can attest to that. I think those that's a great report. I think those are good numbers based on what we're seeing in the market. The 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 difference here is is that through this through this through through distributed ledger technology, um, we have the ability to have uniqueness in the digital world and ownership and that creates the ability to uh, to um, you know fundamentally rethink money and create a form of it uh, that can be you know that can be directly transferred that can have some of the characteristics of physical cash but do so much you know do do many more things and John may go into um, you know more of that but um, across the board there are just material you know material initiatives underway to explore the valuable use cases figure out where there's real value um, where there isn't it isn't a panacea for for all money it's say uh, it has very specific uses. And so I'm going to leave more of the details to John to talk about what's going on in the, in the global landscape. But um, I want to take advantage of the time with uh, with Jen. And so, Jen, maybe just as a starting point, um, you know, just high level, you know, observations, uh, you know, direction around what, why, why is this in, interesting for core capital markets infrastructure? Uh, central bank digital currencies in particular. I think I think we all want faster payment rails. I think um, even in our personal lives, we want faster payment rails. We all love the immediacy of things. And so this is, you know, by, by rethinking how we can process um, settlements and payments across our various asset classes and functions, I think there's just some really interesting opportunities to Hopefully reduce costs. I think I don't. I don't personally have any numbers behind that to to justify that it's a way to lower costs. But ultimately, when you think about how blockchain works and you think about the distributed nature of the data and its um, ability to um, 
to have you know this overall transparency to the over to the network and what's happening i think you know you can assume that there's some you know cost reduction over time um, that you could see i think efficiency i mean we love efficiency i'm uh, in our industry as well and um i think that's another reason why i think if to the extent that the, the better use of capital you have, the more you can do, right? The more liquidity you can bring to the to the um, markets and um, being able to have a better control over that, I think is probably top of mind for many of the folks in our industry today. Yeah, and, and so, so you know, let, we'll, we'll, let's come back to the, to the really, really focus of CVD, you know, the real focus of CVDC, but even pull back for a second, right? The, the DTCC has done some fantastic work over the past years, um, you know, with Project, uh, Project Ion and Whitney. Just, the, just, you know, just talk, for, talk for a minute bit around the, the importance of tokenization broadly and, and the, you know, the whole, the, 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 you know, tokenization as a concept and, and maybe, maybe, um, sorry, I'm, I'm definitely leading the witness here. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, Maybe um, also focus on where you know there was some was there was some wild exuberance early on, right? Particularly in the startup community or the community that was kind of outside of core capital markets um, around you know well this just you know instant settlement is that is the thing and it's all going to be bilateral and instant and wouldn't that be great? Um, just uh, you know um, uh, spend a few minutes. Let's just let's yeah. just dispel the you know some of the myths around where it's where it, where tokenization of of the of the securities and the cash. And and the and the pro you know the settlement processes um, you know people need to have a, a, a an understanding of where it's valuable and where it's definitely not. Yeah, I, I look so for me. So a lot of these these projects that you just mentioned have been fantastic experiences for us, and and um, and we've been able to partner on them, and with that it's been it has been great. Talk you know working with clients around the concepts, validating the concepts, understanding what their real pain points and needs are. All of that has been fantastic. But all it's all been driven and this stays with me. I think I've been with DTCC now six years and I think a year in, you know, Mike came out to one of our fintech forums and said, if anyone's going to disintermediate us, it's going to be us. Right. Uh, you know, I think that the concept that blockchain disintermediates at this in this day and age, I think, is is not so so much of a it's not so prevalent. But what is prevalent is that. In, you know, firms really need to think about how to operate differently in the future. Um, when we look at how we do our, how we process transactions today and how we, how we operate and how we communicate with each other and share data and things of that nature, uh, there's a lot of it that's archaic. And so, you know, if we're going to take ourselves into, you know, the next 40 years, you know, what is that going to look like? And, you know, I, I think we've got so you know, technology advancements, communication advancements have just changed the narrative for us. And so it's it's imperative that we start to look at these things. Tokenization just fit right into that, right? It was, uh, again, another question from Mike, who has been a tremendous innovation leader for us, who said, hey, guys, what is, you know, all this ICO stuff is going on. Like, you know, what is this going to mean for us? What happens next? And so we've had the we've had the fortunate role within the organization to look at these different innovations and think about not just what they are right now because quite frankly i think all innovations evolve and what we what they start as is not what they end up as right and they that's not what ends up actually making the most impact and so i think now we've seen a couple of years where there's been an evolution of the use of di more digitalized assets and how that could potentially drive greater value for our industry. So breaking down, you know, the, you know, being able to take assets, put them on a blockchain, create automation, wrap that automation around the asset, if you will, um, and drive efficiency through better data distribution, transparency, um, you know, et cetera, and even ease of access. There's also just uh, over time, you know, do you ease the access to your networks and your platforms and drive greater business opportunities? And I know I've, I've heard a lot of people, we talk a lot about new business models that can come off of the back of this. These are all things that we think about and want to be a part of. So with Project Ion, um, and Whitney, they each had somewhat different hypotheses going in, but each of them was originally designed to tackle a question around tokenization. What does it mean if we want to re-represent 
tokens or securities on a blockchain, that's ION. Um, and then what does it mean if we want to natively issue tokens and manage those assets, et cetera, that became Whitney. Two different um, markets, public markets, private markets. Um, so really interesting opportunities for us to explore the concepts and understand what the real value is. Now, I'll close with this one thing. You, you said, you know, can we get faster settlement on blockchain? Uh, you know, you can get faster settlement on a better payment rail, period. <laughs> so I don't know that it has to be blockchain, but um, and I certainly don't think that, you know, with regards to the securities markets, blockchain doesn't actually reduce the capital requirements or the capital um, considerations that firms have who are um, transacting in that space. Right. That, you know, what really drives that is reducing the date by which you settle. Um, and so if the industry gets behind and, you know, as I think, as everyone knows, is getting behind right now a T1 settlement that will in inevitably reduce the capital that's required and therefore free up that capital for other uses and improve the end to end process. You don't need blockchain to do that. Can blockchain potentially take us a step further? It, we think there is there's possibilities there, but we're still working through that. Yeah, no. Um, th thank you, you know, for that. I think it's um, it, there's it's a it's obviously on the surface, you know, it seems you know it, it, there's lots of misunderstanding of the simplicity of well, I'm just buying and selling an asset. You know what? You know the um, the 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 massive you know value and and service that that clearinghouses provide and the DTC pr provides you know um, uh, you know around being able to net and compress that activity so that the for the efficiency of the system and the liquidity is key. I think the other thing that, that you know Jen we've 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 spent a lot of time talking about is when you think about the modernization of the of the of our financial infrastructure and and the systems that are required to be able to carry forward you know, that the the fundamental you know. The, the fundamental depth of understanding of what systemically important infrastructure is and how it needs to operate and the expectations around it and and the and the control mechanisms um you know just crucially important and and the you know arguably the dtcc is is the you know i would it, it has to be in the ranking if you were ever to say you know this to sit around and say what is the most successful consortia ever um, you know, it, it has to rank up there, right? And it in its history of uh, you know 100, 170 clearing participants, you know, trillions in value flowing through it, and you know, all on a systemically important infrastructure basis. Um, how do you think about kind of how the you know as as modernization, you know, as as we hit a wave of modernization, how do you think about the you know the the you know the current you know highest standard of security resilience you know control predictability that that you know the dtcc provides um to the system today how do you think about how you know how that plays out as we go through this wave of innovation you know i think it's it's somewhat like any new technology really uh, even cloud technology cloud has been around now for at least a decade and and you know financial institutions are still getting you know themselves ready to adopt in a more meaningful way around tier one applications, et cetera. There's still there's still time for that technology to mature to meet the, the resiliency and the performance and the scalability needs and and things of that nature of of our highly regulated entities. And um, so with blockchain again, I think you know as we look at tokenization and blockchain and the and the combination and use of multiple technologies. I think we have to apply that same lens. I mean, our, we've spent decades learning about the pitfalls of implementing new technology and dealing with bugs and, and things of that nature. Not what things seem to work really well right now. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't modernize and we shouldn't think about how to, how to get us you know, moving into and, and become even more operationally efficient. But we do have to keep in mind that what we what we do today matters and it and it and it's critical and those critical applications should not be taken lightly. So when it comes to thinking about implementing a new blockchain technology or network, you know, you have to think about the governance of that network and you have to think about who's providing that governance and you know who's managing you know, updates, who's resolving issues or problems, who's ultimately to a regulator accountable for that network and how are you going to maintain it? Um, how are you going to um, provide um, 
uh, transparency to how the participants will operate on the platform and who does what and um, how te new technology or new smart contracts or new um, elements of the blockchain technologies are deployed and when and what does that mean for your ecosystem or your network of participants and how they've adopted nodes or APIs and things of that nature. So I, I think you know, thinking about all of those components, that's what trusted intermediaries do today, right? We, we put those wrappers around our platforms, our infrastructure to help protect and ensure the integrity of our markets. And so this is, this technology is, is no different the way, the way that we look at it. Um, we just hope that it, it enables and drives some even greater value than what we have today. But in terms of just operating it, I think we need to apply a lot of what we do today and the lessons that we've learned over the course of these last several decades um, onto the use of new technology. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions coming in. Um, a, you know, a good one from John Carpenter here around um, around T plus one settlement and, and envisioning going to T zero. And maybe let me let me extend the question a little bit. Like, is that even you know what about dynamic or variable or opportunistic settlement windows? Like, what's the what's your view on what we should be thinking about or or you know or you thinking about as an industry and talking about um, from as a potential you know. Uh, you know, rather I think, than just a binary, you know, it's, yeah, it's either you know, yeah. yeah. Rather than prescribing something, I feel like there's a there's a better opportunity to set ourselves up with technology to do what the industry needs when they need it, right? And so, um, you know, I look, we've we've spent a lot of time with clients. We continue to spend a lot of time with our clients to understand the impacts of moving to different settlement dates, um, and and without without critical mass moving to a settlement a short settlement cycle um, doesn't add a lot of value right if you've only got one person that's willing to transact with you on an accelerated basis that doesn't actually result in much difference to you i think at the end of the day i think what's more important for us to think about rather than we need to prescribe t0 or we need to prescribe you know multiple settlement slices throughout the day or real-time settlement or whatever um, is to real is just to think about the implementation of technology on a going forward basis in a more flexible manner. So including things like real time netting capabilities and positioning so that you know where you're at at any given point in time. And then, you know, the settlement, the settlement discussion can evolve as the industry evolves and new, you know, and, and they become and new services. So the things around equities clearing and settlement, for example, and this is, I believe, the, the asset class we're talking about, um, that those other products and services, as they start to evolve and become more real time and or T, you know, T, then, you know, then the opportunity just opens up for different, you know, different settlements, right? So. Yeah, and and if I and and I yeah couldn't agree more that the I, I guess the other important part of that too is if it's if it's if it's a separate leg if it's if there, if there are separate legs for the movement and the and the the verification the settlement of the security and the cash um, that obviously then you know it, it naturally. Um, or implicitly involves then a, a, you know, a set of messaging and reconciliation processes that you know may not give us you know we certainly lots to be gained and we could get money you know we could get much faster on today's systems as as Mike and you and Rob and you know to talk about you know all the time but but if we think about the tech you know the the technology capabilities that can be applied and that are being tested right that ultimate you know I think that ultimate flexibility that you reference to then configure to what the what the users want. You know that that notion of doing delivery versus payment in, in in a single step, you know, at the right moment of you know of the cash and the security, creates max you know creates that maximum flexibility. And I think that's yeah. you know that's the that's what we have to explore is the the implications of that, right? You know, because you're talking about refunded models and you're talking about exactly. you know having to change your cash management processes yep. and um and all the way back to the you know to access to the Fed window and and you know and the central bank digital currency that supports it. So yeah. um, I think that's really important, David, because again, this isn't about you know this is the industry moving towards a different settlement date is is a huge positive, right? Getting to T1 is gonna is gonna create a lot of value for the industry. Um, and, but this isn't, you know, this again, this really is about thinking more broadly about how you improve your end-to-end -end processes, not just this one thing. And I, I do believe that asset class is a really important um, conversation here. 
you know, and, and regions and loca like locations. Like, you know, when you think about the volume, you mentioned it, you referenced it earlier, you know, going to tease, you know, real time gross, you know, without having that benefiting the industry, benefiting from that netting capability is, you know, could be worse, like could be worse for them. Right. And so ultimately, you know, you have to think about the market you're addressing, the asset class you're, that you're addressing, the size of that marketplace, the volume of activity, the value you get in netting, you know, on a T1 basis or a T. I think that all of that stuff comes into comes into play as you're as we're moving this stuff forward. Yeah, and and and, and it, you know, this the I mean, the thing one of the things I'm excited about is it plays into our industry strength. Right, Are, you know, you get, you know, provided the technical capability to do to do some of the things you're talking about. We are fantastic as an industry of pricing that, like, you know, the, the risk <laughs> pricing, the transaction pricing, the, you know, the, the, you know, the further refine, you know, the further, further, you know, configurability and and product and services that can be built up around it to to yeah. you know increase liquidity, yeah. you know, you know, increase you know cash management, collateral management, you know, all of that is just I think a, a fantastic frontier. But we yeah. got to have the foundation to be able to work from it. And again, um, you know, what what you, what what you started to build gives us you know those first insights. I think it's fantastic. Um, yeah. Craig, I'm gonna and uh, and Eric, I'm gonna some of these questions that are out there. I'm gonna unless Jen wants to, I, you know, Jen, Jen's Jen's cat, you know, our our capital markets, you know, core, you know, global expert. I'm going to save some of the retail stuff for uh, for uh, Velisarios to handle here in a minute. Um, unless Jen, you want to jump in on it, I'm happy. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving my personal view as as a, as a retailer, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, so let me let me save some of those for uh, for for John in a few minutes. But um, you know, Jen, in terms of in terms of um, you know, cer certainly there are. Um, you know, in the hyperledger community, we've got a you know we've got a large number of of your clients and our clients. Um, you know, you know here and in the ecosystem, and we're all working together. You know, what what would you you know what would you recommend with respect to how you know how and where to engage? You know, the opportunities that the you know that that are out there to um, you know to get to get directly involved with you know the fundamental rethinking of what core capital markets infrastructure um, should be uh, in you know in in the future. <laughs> I think, um, look, I, I we've got a number of different touch points um, ac across the client communities. Um, I think to the extent that that there's interest across the open source community and just under better understanding kind of what we're doing. I think we've got a, um, you know, on our website you can reach out and submit, you know, some requests to to meet and things of that nature. I think we post a lot around what we're doing from a fintech standpoint. Uh, Rob Platnick is chair of the governing board for Hyperledger, um, so there's opportunities through there. And I think on different projects we've had some technology resources that are contributing as well. And so there's there's certainly some some opportunities just to engage and network along those lines no that that you know that that's great and um and i suppose um it, you know important to say that um you know in 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 some of the work that's been done already we've we've put good use you know put put some of the hyperledger code to good use you know in particular the you know cactus and blockchain automation framework uh yeah. you know focus it's um you know, it's even, been, our, been even our project whitney prototype we um after we after we um, connected to Ethereum, we then connected to you know connected the prototype to Hyperledger. Um, so that was that was a good experience as well for us. Yeah, excellent. Um, any any last thoughts, Jen? Uh, you know, I, I pro sorry for the rest of you. I promised Jen she could throw as many questions to me as I did to her, and I've not given her that chance. So <laughs> I think this has been a great discussion. I think you know one of the things I probably just would probably end on here is there's within our within our financial industry, it's often difficult to um, to get people to understand that things just don't happen as quickly as they often would like them to, but things are happening. And so I think just across Accenture, across DTCC, and there are, you know, hand, there's many, many other financial institutions in the space that are progressing the conversation and, and use cases and business opportunities using distributed ledger and tokenized assets and even looking at concept of digital currencies. And so I think it's, it should be viewed upon as just incredibly positive to see see these um iterations continue i think it's only gonna you know ramp up and be you know accelerate over time so i'd say don't lose faith people are still do we're working really hard it's just that some of these problems are just not easy things to solve overnight so um so i'd say that's all all good things are happening right now 
Awesome. Well, um, Jen, I appreciate you joining joining in this discussion with us. And um, and yes, yeah, between you know Jen, Rob, um, you know you know me, there there are a number of of uh, of of the leadership team, uh, you know, very focused on central bank digital currency and the and the and you know wider tokenization potential for core capital markets infrastructure. So um, I'm seeing there's one last question before we have to pivot here. Uh, say we already have the technology to do this by climbing fabric. Um, yeah, the, the, there are a number of technologies are being, you know, are, are, are being apl applied and yes, it's, uh, you know, the, there's, we, you know, as you can imagine, right, with Jen and Rob and my focus on the, you know, Hyperledger board, the, you know, open source is a key, you know, is key to this whole space, um, particularly as we get, you know, as we talk about interoperability um, and, uh, and how important that's going to be as we connect these islands of implementation of different ecosystems. Um, so Jen, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, Jen and I are going to drop here, but I'm going to bridge to John Belisarios, who's going to, uh, you've been patient, John, um, uh, <laughs> wait, wait, patiently waiting here. Um, uh, I'm going to pivot, uh, bridge to John. Uh, who, who, as I said in the opening, leads our central bank digital currency work at Accenture globally, and has been at it for, gosh, you know, six years officially, but probably more like eight, um, if I if I think about your other roles, John. Um, and uh, and I'll, and John, I'll, John, will dive into some of the uh, the work that's happening globally, how to think about it, get to some of these questions here around um, the whole umbrella space of digital currency being, you know, cryptocurrency, stablecoin, and CBDC, and why they are each fundamentally different, and where they're, you know, wh where what the use cases are for each. Um, and, uh, and with that, uh, John, you guys are in great hands. I will turn over to John and, uh, and thanks everyone for, uh, for your time and, uh, and questions. Uh, I look forward you. to engaging offline. John, thanks so much. Thank you. John, over to you. Uh oh, I can't hear you, John. All right, well, John sorts out his audio issue. I've got like two, <laughs> two minutes before I've got to run the support. Actually, uh, uh, there is a, um, oh, we'll, hopefully we get John back here. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to watch my clock very carefully. I've got, uh, interestingly, there's a, there's a uh, Senate banking hearing today um, I, that, uh, that I have to go um, support in the background for uh, uh, on central bank digital currency. Uh, where um, Christian Carlo, on behalf of the Digital Dollar Project, is going to be testifying around uh, the the progress within the U.S. context of of uh, you know, doing some real uh, testing, pilot testing of uh, of CBDC and the use cases and uh, uh, and what what we've seen is just a fantastic lean in from the uh, from the regulatory community um, and the and the Hill on wanting to uh, wanting to learn and understand and, and make sure we're we have uh, crisp, consistent language to to talk through all of the the uh, the the policy choices ahead of us, the 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 value cases, the you know the modernization of regulation. Um, Helen, do you think we're gonna get John back? <laughs> I was just uh, gonna pop on and say, if you want to run, I can stay and help uh, facilitate John joining uh, rejoining. <laughs> okay. Um, I do need to, I do need to go. Um, so I, I apologize. Um, we will have a brief interlude. Um, uh, and uh, um, thanks again. Uh, hopefully, John can get back on here in, in a second. But um, thanks for everyone's time. Uh, I apologize. I have to go. Thanks. Sure, thank you so much. So everyone, we will just uh, stand by and wait for John to uh, rejoin. I am back. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Just checking. Sound check. Yes, fantastic. Oh, right. Sorry about that. I had to uh, disconnect and reconnect. Uh, not uh, not ideal. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for sticking around. Uh, look forward to sort of this presentation. Thanks for for taking the time um, this, today to, to listen to Dave and Jen about more about sort of uh, CBDC and the work that we're doing in this space. Uh, and I know what's been what's been happening. I think just globally uh, in terms of the whole topic of CBDC. Um, I, I just want to share, I guess, a little bit of background behind uh, behind what's been going on over the last several years. Um, first of all, just to just to comment a little bit about our history in this area. We've been working in this space, as Dave mentioned, uh, for several years. Our work, actually, our very first project in in, in this uh, space. 
uh, was with a very was with a central bank several years ago, and since then we've been working with a number of different central banks, both in the retail space and in the wholesale space, and um, uh, and the whole, this whole space has been sort of uh, taking off uh, incredibly uh, over the last year at least, and uh, and I see this sort of a, as a, a continuing trend, uh, at least for at least for a couple of years, if not much more than that. The BIS, as uh, Dave mentioned. Uh, has also been uh, Bank for International Settlements has also been very actively involved in this area and trying to grow sort of the awareness and the knowledge and sharing experiences and building out sort of uh, sort of the whole uh, thought leadership behind uh, uh, central bank digital currencies. And in addition to that, we also see sort of uh, quite a lot of central banks around the world, and I'll mention a few of them, um, all public, of course, uh, that have been developing solutions and trying to experiment, pilot, uh, implement. Uh, various uh, sort of uh, in, uh, projects and so on uh, to sort of take the CBDC to the next level. But before we do that, I think I want to mention a couple of things about what, what's the innovation behind CBDC. Um, and I think this is, uh, there's some questions as well that sort of came up before, but I'll try to answer them as they sort of uh, come across here. Uh, but the real innovation is the ability to sort of bundle both uh, the value and the ownership uh, in a single item that you can transfer from one entity to the next, whether it's a, a, a bank paying another financial institution, whether it's a security settlement, or whether it's uh, whether it's a consumer paying another consumer um, or get transferring money to another uh, individual. Uh, it, it's the value of, of, of this solution and approach, which is now possible because of the technology that enables all of this to take off. And I think uh, why now? I, I think there's a couple of reasons why we see this happening. One is the technology has become much more mature. Um, innovation, I guess, with cryptocurrencies from over a decade ago, um, in addition to the number of developments in the whole DLT space, have enabled this kind of technology to actually be uh, enabling sort of a central bank digital currency and, and enabling it to take off. And this, I think, is a, is a really key sort of uh, sort of milestone, I think, from a, from a financial and technology uh, innovation perspective. So uh, th that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I think sort of there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more sort of appetite for uh, it in the marketplace. There's a digital assets, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, a variety of different new sort of financial instruments, products, uh, innovations, developments, uh, and so on that are, that are taking off. And, and what, what we're seeing with um, uh, central banks is uh, they also don't want to be left behind. And, and I think many of, the many of the central banks that we're working with uh, sort of are also you know conscious that corporations like um, the large corporations that are looking at implementing their own version of money uh, tokenized money uh, stable coins and, and what have you uh, also ha also can create potentially competitive pressure on on central banks and some geographies uh, for instance um, and regardless I think this is also it opens the door for much more uh, developments uh, to, uh, to take off. Now, if we take a look at sort of what, what's happening around the globe, um, there's a digital dollar project in the U.S., the digital euro, uh, you know, that the ECB has announced uh, that they will be looking into, uh, in addition to the digital GBP initiative that's been taking off, and, and you can sort of see the story play out uh, in many different geographies uh, around the globe. Uh, there are countries like in Sweden, for instance, that have been very active in this area for several years, uh, researching um, Writing a bunch of writing white papers, uh, soliciting sort of interest from the market and input from the market, and so on. In addition to sort of uh, also implementing sort of the pilots uh, that we are involved in and, and in their in, the, in their sort of progression in this area, and and looking at it from a, primarily from a retail perspective, but also uh, other central banks looking at it from a broader wholesale perspective, such as. Uh, South Africa that's been also experimenting with this in this area, both in retail and wholesale. Um, uh, historically, Bank of Canada, MAS, has been uh, very actively involved in this area as well, also central banks in the Middle East, uh, and so on. So the, the story um, goes on and on, I think, with regards to this. There's many different central banks that, around the world that have been sort of implementing sort of pilots and, and, and uh, really in the thick of things. This is where I think the innovation uh, is taking off. What, what we're seeing is sort of uh, central banks developing, sort of um, answering exam questions in the form of pilots, but also taking it to the next level where they're actually implementing it for, uh, with the intent of implementing something in the future. 
Now, there are sort of a couple of different areas uh, that we look at when we talk about central bank digital currency. The first one is in the retail space. So what's happening in the retail, um, in the broader retail space, and, and I think from a consumer point of view, it begs the question, why does the consumer need a central bank digital currency when there's a plethora of, of commercial bank money and, and, and commercial payment systems that are out there? Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, wholesale, uh, which Jennifer and Dave, uh, you know, very went into lots of detail about, um, and also the cross-border space where there's a lot of a, a lot of uh, potential because of the friction associated with cross-border payments. Now, if you start looking at all of these, it's almost like a Venn diagram. You can start combining all three three of these and, and, and sort of seeing retail cross-border, commercial or so wholesale cross-border, and so on. And there's a lot of potential there for. Uh, reducing counterparty risk, uh, taking friction out of the process uh, of value transfers and so on, but also creating new types of financial uh, instruments that were not possible before. We look at CBDC as a third format of format of money, form of money. Um, and today you have two different formats of money. You have banknotes that consumers hold in their wallet, and you have central bank money in digital form primarily. Uh, in the form of, a, of, a, of an RTGS platform and a system that allows a ledger to be able to uh, be updated with positions that a central bank holds against a number of commercial banks that hold accounts with the central bank. But nowhere is there any sort of uh, central bank liability in digital format for consumers or even for commercial entities. Uh, so this, is, this gives us the ability to actually create and innovate and to develop something entirely new, this new format of money um, is uh, is possible because of the technology that we talked about, but also it enables a number of things that were previously not possible. Instant value bearing, uh, digital tokens that could be spent by consumers to pay one another, uh, merchants to pay merchants, for instance, or even organizations to pay uh, each other, um, and also enabling things like cross-border payments in a direct peer-to-peer uh, -peer relationship, uh, which I think is, is quite unique and also highly innovative. We also see the opportunity for um, this new format of money to enable something that was not possible before, holding a central bank liability in digital format outside of one's jurisdiction. And I think this today is uh, something that uh, any type of central bank liability, apart from other type of treasury notes and other things that are not CBDC, not, not a CBDC of course, uh, are sort of uh, not in digital format held, uh, held in another jurisdiction. And as a result, what we see is that that can create a, a, an interesting dynamic where you can have offshore or extra jurisdictional settlement and payments uh, in a way that, that was not possible before. And this is exactly one of the projects that we're working on with the Banque de France and a cross-border uh, initiative with another central bank where we can settle um, cent with central bank money in, a, in an extra jurisdictional environment. And I think that is that can create uh, a, a very, very different uh, dynamic than we've ever seen before. Uh, and this is where the innovation will take us. I think also, you know, what Jennifer mentioned in that we don't know sort of, you know, we, we sort of see the, the, the path in front of us and, and probably a couple of iterations deeper, but we really don't know how far this can go and what it can potentially enable. And this is this is where the innovation can really take in. Um, there are a number of things to consider, of course. Uh, things like um, you know interoperability standardization. How do you enable this in a, on a global basis uh, and, and allow sort of uh, entities to continue to pay one another and, and, and operate interoperate? Uh, and today the financial system has done a, a fantastic job at stitching all of that together and enabling sort of through a series of complex plumbing and, and, and wiring uh, a, a lot of us to to be able to interoperate and, and, and work uh, on a global basis. And I think from a CBDC point of view, this is still very, very early days because what we, what we need to do is, is develop what, we, what is currently there in that kind of infrastructure, but in a new format of money, which of course is not straightforward to do. So I think that's where we will spend uh, a, lot of, a lot of cycles. Um, and so things like open source are going to be key. Things like um, uh, technologies that allow a level of interoperability are going to be key. Uh, and open as well uh, will be very important for us to, to explore as we develop these kind of innovations. Now, if I look at sort of the future, um, and um, I only talk briefly about some of the projects, um, and, and I think that 
if I look at sort of where this could potentially go, I think there's a number of, of these innovations that will take us um, take us into sort of what the future looks like. I, I mentioned a little bit about retail, uh, and from from a consumer point of view, um, it begs the question: you know, what's the benefit for for a consumer? I, and and that I think is uh, and it's an interesting question. We we've also been talking about that at length as well on on, on projects. Uh, and it isn't very obvious what is a CBDC, uh, something like digital currency, uh, the benefit of CBDC for a consumer versus um, from, from a wholesale or commercial application. And from a consumer, uh, most likely uh, the vast majority of people will probably not know what a CBDC is or central bank digital currency is versus their electronic money or, or e-money or even money in their bank account. Um, and. I think that's that's an important point to, to, to sort of realize and, and also that requires a lot of education and stakeholder engagement and involvement in order to take this to the next level. And I think this is also part of these kind of projects where when we talk about CBDC and we look at it from a consumer point of view, we also need to be very mindful that we have to have that sort of engagement with a wider marketplace. Um, on a wholesale basis, uh, there are a lot of uh, other applications that we see and, and where we talk about settlement um, and, and specifically sort of settlement of securities trading and as Jennifer pointed out, um, we, we see sort of uh, you know, having a digital asset, uh, tokenized digital asset uh, and a tokenized form of digital cash, only then do we have truly the ability to do a DVP settlement. And, and apart from settlement windows, settlement cycles and compressing it from a time perspective, there's, this also allows uh, a different sort of uh, models of exchange and settlement in such a way that uh, that immediacy, not necessarily just the speed, but also the elimination of the counterparty risk, I think is the, one of the key benefits of using it from a securities point of view. And this is where we also see a lot of applications of this um, and, and enabling different types of DVP uh, models that, that when you have a tokenized form of, of an asset and a tokenized form of cash, enabling sort of that instant value transfer and a asset transfer to take place in a risk-free, uh, risk less risk-free or, or uh, highly reduced risk uh, environment. And I think this is where we, we see sort of it playing out in capital markets as well as uh, in other forms of, of, um, of, of CBC applications. Um, in in cross-border, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of frictions, time, delay, cost. Uh, there are a number of other sort of uh, things to consider with regards to cross-border payments, uh, liquidity, access to liquidity, and, and so on. And I think when we see sort of applications of multiple CBDCs being implemented, then we will end up sort of seeing a lot of uh, uh, very interesting sort of uh, cross-border applications of, of this taking off. And I think this is where there will be a lot of uh, developments that are going to be happening uh, when multiple central banks issue their, their central bank digital currency and allow sort of uh, participants outside of their jurisdiction to hold it and transact it. Then we will see very interesting FX models, FX trades, bilateral trades, uh, in addition to sort of uh, new types of commercial applications uh, taking off. And that's when we can embed things like smart contracts, cross-border payments, trade finance, and, and so on into these end-to-end uh, -end sort of processes. So I think this is there's quite a lot of, uh, of scope, I think, from, from all those three dimensions. Now, I'll, I'll pause there. Um, I'm going to start sort of looking at some of the questions. And maybe you can answer some of the questions because I know that there's a few of them that have been uh, 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 listed here. Uh, and if you have any more, please feel free to sort of uh, drop them in. Um, I, uh, I'll look at... Uh, Craig asks a question. Uh, thank you, Craig, for the question. Um, a key concern around deploying a CBDC seems to be the unintended consequences that could impact retail banking providers. What strategies uh, are you seeing sort of central banks adopting to avoid these? Um, excellent question. Um, we sort of, uh, when we look at sort of retail CBDC projects, we also sort of look at uh, optimal configurations of those models. Uh, and in that, there are a number of um, sort of what I would call uh, key parameters to look at. And one of them um, is really looking at sort of what's the role of commercial banks in a central bank digital currency uh, deployment. And we see sort of uh, a two-tier model where central banks 
uh, in exchange for reserves issue um, uh, CBDC to commercial banks who then in exchange for deposits issue them to consumers. In that model, uh, what we're doing is we're basically replacing the cash uh, through an ATM transaction with a digital version of that uh, for consumers. And, and the role of the commercial bank is very much the KYC, AML relationship holder with, a, with the, the end user, the consumer, uh, issuer of the wallet perhaps, and the registration of that wallet, and then allowing sort of that wallet to contain sort of that CBDC that, could, that, that, that will be used in, in sort of transactions by consumers. Um, and I think there, uh, there are a lot of other type of uh, things to keep in mind in those kind of implementations. The first one is really looking at how do you uh, ensure that um, you know, there isn't a digital run, basically. Basically, everybody withdrawing all of their deposits, converting them into CBDCs, and then running off with it and creating a, a digital run uh, for, from, a, from, a, uh, from, a, from the bank's perspective. And I think that's a very important point, and there are a number of things that I would, I would say that are mitigating factors. One is, would you store all of your wealth or all of your money in a digital wallet um, if, you, if you wanted to do that? I mean, at the end, Yes, you can convert it instantaneously from your deposit, put it into the wallet, but would you do that? Would you put your entire life savings in those wallets? So, and at the same time, would you put or, or through policy and other type of controls, would there be a single wallet issued to a consumer? Uh, would you have limits on the wallet? Could you put sort of threshold and, and ceiling limits in terms of how much you can sort of hold on the wallet in order to contain that kind of a uh, and, and to mitigate that kind of a risk of a bank, a digital bank run. In addition to that, um, the reason why you, you also have a this digital bank run is because consumers get sort of uh, nervous and you go to the bank to withdraw the money, and of course there's not enough physical money to withdraw from the bank. Uh, yes, that will deplete sort of the bank's reserves, but also there's a physical dimension of not, being, not having as much money to be able to give to the consumers to begin with. Of course, that's fractional reserve banking. In a digital bank run environment, in such an environment, in a stress environment, uh, a central bank could intervene, uh, could potentially, um, to the bank, uh, inject it, infuse it with uh, a CBDC uh, to tide it over until there's a, a until that run and scenario sort of uh, sort of goes away, uh, and there is an infinite sort of limit or, or you know digital. There's no digital limit to how much can be issued. Uh, in such an environment, in a physical environment, of course, you're limited by how much people can withdraw from an ATM and how fast you can stuff those banknotes into an ATM. And all of that will create sort of that level of panic, which will continue to sort of progress. So if consumers felt, you know, I wanted my money, I hit the button and I get all my money. Well, now what do I do with all that money? Do I keep it there or do I put it back where I where it came from? Whereas in a, in a physical you know, environment, it's a different scenario. So I think hopefully, Craig, I've answered that question. Um, and uh, you know, give you sort of some some sort of perspective that there are a number of um, sort of scenarios that could be mitigated through policy controls and other types of physical uh, sort of uh, digital controls that you can put on wallets, um, and and also how you set up the environment from a two you know, single single to a two tier structure. So basically, using the commercial banks as a way to distribute. Uh, you know, mirroring the cash distribution cycle that you have uh, today uh, with the current banking system. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, PayPal announced in February that it would uh, it would like to be a CBDC distributor. What do you foresee as the primary channels by which CBDCs will be rolled out to the public? Um, commercial banks, uh, payment service providers, um, potentially uh, e-money organizations that are out there, uh, PSPs basically. Uh, I don't think there's a limit uh, to sort of the, uh, I think it would have to be sort of regulated entities that have proper KYC and AML checks, which PayPal does. They do that kind of stuff for their, for their clients and for their uh, consumers. Um, and I think those would be the kind of organizations that would, you know, be ideal for running sort of, uh, being sort of a distributor of CBC into, into the market. Uh, and I could see, you know, organizations like PayPal and other P PSPs and other sort of providers globally you know, stepping into that role uh, because it's all digital in nature uh, and also having multiple wallets that you can use gives you the ability to then run that uh, as well, you know, as part of one of the many currency 
concurrencies in this case currency type but you could you could also host in terms of uh, those kind of uh, implementations so I think that that's definitely a doable one um, and I think there are going to be a number of uh, PSPs that will, uh, will step into that role we've seen that in other projects um, and, I, and I see that that will be um, uh, taken on by you know, licensed regulated entities that have um, some sort of a license to, to provide those kind of payment services uh, to the marketplace. Um, another question I see here is, okay, that's T plus one. Um, and thanks, Eric, for the link to sort of the University of Cyprus uh, paper. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there are a number of digital, uh, Euro digital sort of initiative papers out there, and, and I encourage you to sort of uh, look at them because there's, there's quite every every week there seems to be several of them uh, and I and I know that there um, there's always uh, sort of people that are publishing points of view and, and organizations that are publishing their points of view uh, BIS is very active in this area many of the central banks are very active in this area and also the academic institutions that are publishing sort of their perspective on CBDC uh, I think this will be an area of study um, you know, on, you know for, for many years um, and, and there's going to be plenty of, uh, of sort of great thought leadership that comes out of the universities uh, in, in the near future. Um, the one thing I would say as well is that this is a very multidisciplinary field. So this is really, there is a, there is a technology component, of course, to this. And there's, there's quite a lot to, to, to step into it from a technology point of view. But there, this is very multidisciplinary. You're looking at macro, microeconomics, you're looking at theory, you're looking at strategy, you're looking at geopolitics, you're looking at all sorts of different dimensions. And I think that's really what captures the essence of this topic. And I think we're, you know, we're, we're the, the strength of having these multi, multidisciplinary teams is really going to stand out and enable us to sort of a, uh, look at this in a much more uh, clever way. Um, there's a question about uh, Bitcoin as legal tender, and a C uh, uh, is your opinion about having Bitcoin rather than CBDC proprietary crypto developed? I think from many central banks um, don't want to, to devolve that responsibility, uh, uh, fiscal policy objectives to an external force, um, and they want to be in ultimate control. I mean, that's a prudent um, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of central bank that would do that. And I think that's also going to play out, I think, in terms of many of the different CBDC initiatives. Um, the more, uh, I mean, this is a policy decision, this is a government decision as well. We're also working with regulators uh, to help sort of structure the right regulation, law changes in law, and what policy de de decisions need to be made in order to sort of even implement a CBDC to go all the way to sort of something where you don't have that control and it's uh, basically sort of supply and uh, other types of uh, uh, macroeconomic implications would, would emerge by, by sort of uh, devolving that to, a, to an external uh, force. So I, I think it's interesting, but um, I don't see that happening very often in many different geographies as well. So um, that's, I think, that's it for the questions. Um, how are we doing on time? Two minutes. So if there's no more questions, um, feel free to pop them in if there's anything else. Um, I just want to make a couple of closing remarks. Uh, there's, this is a very fast-moving space. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of work being done globally, uh, more and more so. I, I encourage those that are interested in this, to, uh, this topic uh, to please uh, you know, reach out to the uh, folks that are, that are like myself and, and Dave and myself and others that are actively working in this area. Um, and let us know if you're, you know, we can share ideas and, and share and collaborate. I, I, one thing I, I would say is that in this, in this whole space, that it's been incredibly uh, collaborative uh, working experience, um, almost a semi-academic environment for, for, for lack of a better description. And I think I'm very encouraged by that. There's a strong willingness to share, uh, to explore open source ideas, to open, openly develop uh, new concepts and new ideas. Uh, and I think that's really what, what's driving a lot of the developments uh, because of this uh, open, you know, openness and, and the nature of this topic. Um, in many central banks look at this as a, as a public-private partnership. It's almost a social contract between government and people um, and, and the economy. Um, so it, it has a much broader uh, you know, a social dimension and implication, I think, than, than other topics that we, that we look at. 
Uh, and on that note, I think it's it's one of the most exciting uh, things to be uh, areas to be working in and to be involved in. So I encourage you to continue to sort of you know have that interest, do the research, you know keep an eye on what's going on, uh, and get ready for sort of innovation that's going to be coming our way you know imminently. And on that note, thank you very much for your time. And uh, if there's uh, any more questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and have a good evening. Thank you.